sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. Where are you? I'm in Hamburg at the moment. Uh, hopefully I'll- Hamburg, make... Germany? Hamburg, Germany, yeah. Stay out of that Reaper bar, man. <laughs> well, I want to go and I want to go and take a look at the uh, the Star Club, or I think it's called the Star Club, where the Beatles had the residency. Oh right, yeah. And I doubt it's like the Star Club back in the '60s at this point with coronavirus and also you know the modern era anyway. Right. Uh, it, it just yeah. Be- well, that, that's where they cut their teeth for real, right? I mean, that's where they yeah. That's where they became what they were. <clears throat> yeah. It would be uh, it would be good to see it. Well, welcome to the greatest music of all time podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, and I wanted to start off by asking you, what was the first thing that you can recall that made you enjoy music? Yeah, I was I was trying to remember this the other day when I was talking to somebody because I sit around with this guitar and learn songs, and a lot of the songs I I'll just you know play songs uh, that I can think of, and um, so I try to think of the first ones I can think of, and apropos of, of the Beatles or that discussion. Um, Band on the Run. I remember that song. It's probably the earliest song I remember hearing. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, you learn it. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's got that killer riff, right? Like that. Uh... Right? I love that riff. So um, that was, uh, that, that one is uh, a great one. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, you know, that, and there was a couple of like Jim Croce songs that were on the radio. You remember him? I, I'm not really a fan, but like, I just remember like being obsessed with that. And, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I don't know. Um, I had a limited exposure to music, you know, as a youngster, really. Uh, really? You know, you have to you have to remember you know i think what's lost on this generation these days is, is that we didn't have accessibility to music right so yeah you, you my parents didn't even have a stereo or a record player there was a drawer that had like four records in it that were like broadway you know <laughs> so i heard what was on the radio and in 1973, it would have been, or 74, you know, around that time, you know, I heard Ban on the Run or uh, things like, um, you know, there'd be a Steely Dan song or something, you know, it was, it was a good time for pop radio. Yeah. But um, uh, in the South, where I grew up, it's also a lot of country music. So I didn't necessarily hear the top 40 or anything as much as I heard you know, uh, Willie Nelson <laughs> and, 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 you know, country music of the seventies and also the things that were happening around where we were, there's some real authentic stuff, right? So um, things that nobody has heard or probably were never recorded. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, and, and did, did you, presumably you didn't get to go to gigs much. I mean, that the accessibility side of music is really interesting because now we assume or people kind of act like they're assuming that it's the same, it, that it was, it's always been the same, you know, we can just listen to anything that we want. And I guess it, it wouldn't occur to, to some people, to younger people, even, you know, younger people than me, that music should be kind of valued more perhaps than it, than it is, or at least that's kind of the way I feel about it uh, based on that. Before yeah. it was really valuable, it must've felt like even more 
in in the seventies. Like to yeah, buy. I mean, no, I mean, it just it just wasn't like a focal point of anybody's lives. I mean, I, I lived out in the country, you know, and I was out in the woods, you know, sh- hunting, fishing, and doing all kinds of stuff. Right, um, getting in trouble, uh, but. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, we all are walking around, you know, with the Library of Congress basically in our in our pocket, right? And 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 so every uh, I look at things like you know the streaming services, and and you can just you can get anything. I mean, so there's something gained and there's something lost, right? Because I don't know if there's an impulse that I would have if I were coming along now to go to a record store and just kind of look around and make a mistake and buy a crap record, but find a, a good one the same time you know now it's just there's nothing you know there's no harm in checking out every single thing on (laughs) that you can get your uh, ears on there so yeah yeah it's uh it's a weird one because there there are pros and cons to it but in terms of when you started playing uh what was the first gig that you ever went to and and when when did you start making your own music or why did you start making your own music first first concert i ever went to uh was it's funny there was a a youth uh, anti drug program <laughs> of all things and um so they they uh they had they, they took us all to see the beach boys now this is not the Brian Wilson beach boys right this is this is beach boys with you know the other guys like the touring group and some some scrubs i'm sure and this would have been 1982 and so i remember thinking you know it just didn't really make an impact on me but then uh, I started getting into this music, uh, like all the hard rock music that was happening in the uh, early 80s. I, so I heard it uh, and was sort of fixated on it. And and we begged a friend's uh, uh, dad to take us to see Van Halen in Memphis. <laughs> so I went to, uh, he drove us on a school night. And I was, I think I was in the eighth grade. And this would have been 1983 in December of 83, but we saw the 1984 tour, which was the last tour with their original singer. And I saw Eddie Van Halen up there doing his thing. And, and uh, it was just, that was it. I was done after that. I was like, there it is. That's the thing, whatever that is, I'm going to do that. I mean, obviously I didn't do that as well as he did, but um, you know, I did it nonetheless. <laughs> I, what, what, how old would you have been then? Uh, this would have been I was I was thirteen, oh. and um, and so I was, uh, you know, I, I, as a kid, I'd really gotten into comic books. You know, I, I would, I would, all the all the things that they're making the movies about now. You know, I was reading those comics when they were coming out, and you know, I I, I thought I was going to be have a career in you know being a, a superhero. But uh, as I got a little older, um, I gradually dawned on me that I wasn't going to get superpowers. So this seemed like something that was a good, uh, a good second place, right? Learn how to play the guitar, and people will yell for me. And so, had you had you ever played the guitar before that point? Before seeing the Eddie Van Halen concert? No, no, and and I, I didn't get one right away. You know, I, I was. I, uh, I begged and begged and begged for somebody to get me. I begged everybody I could sit, find that would listen to me to get me a guitar and then nobody would do it. So I, I, um, I started mowing lawns, <laughs> you know, cutting the grass, right? Uh, and getting paid. And, and I worked a whole summer that following summer and I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to get this guitar, but I, I just didn't, I didn't make enough money. <laughs> and so, uh, but then, you know, my dad bought me a guitar, uh, you know, we used some of that money and he got, he covered the rest of it. And it was, it was a terrible guitar actually, which I, I would, I would like to see that guitar again, but it was a very expensive piece of crap. It was made by Gibson. It was called the Gibson victory. And, you know, I, I love Gibson guitars. I play Les Pauls a lot, you know, but it was, um, yeah, it was, it was just a design nightmare. <laughs> so, but uh, somehow I made it through all that. So, um, uh, and managed to keep going. How did you learn to play the guitar? Yeah. Did you play along to records or did you ever get any lessons or learn in a kind of more classical sense? Well, we didn't have any, you know, there's, you have to understand, uh, this, m- me and one of the other guys in the group, 
are from the same little town in Mississippi. There's about, it's about 8,000 people maybe in the whole county and that's surrounded by hundred miles of bean fields. I mean, there's nothing there. So there, you know, there might've been some older people who played, but we didn't know anybody who was interested in this stuff at all. Like no, nothing, there was no place you could go and see live acts that, you know, weren't playing from behind a chicken wire. So, um, you know, uh, we just, you know, we kind of relied on each other. He started playing around the same time. And, um, and yeah, we would just try to copy the things that we heard. And, you know, there was nobody to give us lessons. So um, we would just, um, you know, we're just kind of making it up as we went along. We had, we formed a band in, in high school. It was absolutely atrocious. And, um, you know, we played cover songs. We would play everything from like the Rolling Stones to R.E.M. <clears throat> or um, it could be, you know, anything or like, you know, uh, uh, Led Zeppelin, things like that. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, it, we, were, we hadn't been doing this very long when we went to California and got a record deal. I mean, I've been playing the guitar, like, seriously, maybe, like, four or five years when we did that record. So When you, when you got that record deal, you've been playing for four or five years? Yeah, yeah, roughly. I mean, you know, the first year, you're not really playing. You're just kind of holding it and seeing it. But then I got really serious about it. I heard you know, music that really started to impact me. And, and, you know, I had, you know, my family dissolved around this time. Right. So I really kind of went inside, went inward. And, and, and for the last three years of high school, I skipped the maximum amount of days per year that you could skip and still pass the grade. Right. And, and, you know, we had a secret plan the whole time we're moving out of this town. We're going to go to California because that's, supposedly where you go and do this sort of thing and so i mean and that's precisely what we did um so you didn't meet in california no well three of us were from this area right so brad the original bass player and me were in a town called west point and glenn and the drummer was in the next town over and this is you know this is this is faulkner country right this is the land that william faulkner wrote about Elvis is from this place. Howlin' Wolf is uh, the shack that he was born in was literally 300 yards across the pasture from the back of my house with a tree growing up in the middle of it. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, this music was around and uh, no one cared about it. I mean, nobody, nobody knew or ever mentioned the word Howlin' Wolf to me, right? I mean, he's from right there. It really, I mean, what it took to make that happen was people from where you're from coming over here and selling it back to us, right? Yeah. I mean, that is preposterous. Now, if you go there, there's a whole, you know, there's the blues trail that goes down through Mississippi and they have these historical markers on it. And, and you know, one of them, you know, comes through where we're from in that town. Chester Arthur is his name. And, um, you know, I, I'm always struck, but there's a BBC film of uh, Howlin' Wolf on the BBC in sort of the early 60s and you and, and sitting around him are like <laughs> the Beat uh, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles looking like little boys, you know, and he's wow. up there and he's, and, and he's singing. You're like, man, that is powerful. It's so powerful um, <clears throat> because he was much of a man. Yeah. Um, yeah, all of those blues artists never really got the recognition that they deserve, considering that. Well, I mean, really, you know, I, you know, the world, you know, the world has changed, obviously, and but some things are the same. But I, I think what they did, you know, I don't know, I don't know if the idea of like a cultural appropriation happened, you know, was was apparent in that time, but I I, I believe that those people genuinely believed that they were trying to boost this music and keep it from being forgotten. And um, I think they did that to an extent. I mean, they were, they, they brought, you know, people over that they liked and they, they, you know, recorded with people, I guess. I mean, I don't know if it's, I don't know. I don't know what lens to view that from in 2021, but. Um, I mean, yeah. I, uh, it's pretty difficult to say yeah. that. 
I can see why why somebody would make the argument that it's cultural appropriation, but is cult I mean, is cultural appropriation a sin in of itself? No, I, well, I don't know, but I, I think it's an, they were. It was also an homage, right? It wasn't taking it without crediting it. No, not at all. So, so, and I think that's what they were doing, and that's the distinction, right? I think you're right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the idea that cultural appropriation, kind of cultural appropriation, where you're passing off other people's work as your own, mm. particularly people who have been discriminated mm. against. Sure. That, that that is, you know, morally indefensible. But when you see things like there was this incident the other day, I think it was someone like Adele put her hair into dreadlocks. I mean, I, I don't think she was saying, or she put it into cornrows, cornrows, mm -hmm. that's what am I talking about? Yeah, she made her hair into cornrows. I, I don't, you know, she wasn't saying, I don't think like, oh, I invented cornrows. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just like putting her hair into cornrows because she thought it was cool. Yeah. Um, and so I struggle to see, and w yeah, with regards to this example of, you know, people at the Stones taking this blues music, I mean, it, it's irrefutable, I guess, that the, the Stones didn't, the Stones have got considerably more credit than people like Howlin' Wolf. So you could say, is that fair? But I mean, at the end of the day, they did, as you say, they brought a lot of those guys over uh, and, and you know, reignited their profile. Yeah, and I think, I think you can see the way that their career has played out too. And, you know, even over the years, they've, they've remained true to that. They've worked with people over the years, um, you know, but hey, they're living their lives too. And, 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 you know, the Rolling Stones are the greatest rock band, you know, in my mind, I think, you know, the Beatles were something different. You know, the Beatles, the Beatles transcended the genre. The Beatles are up here. Everybody else is down here, right? In my, yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, I, I feel that way. I feel like the Stones is rock and roll music, whereas the they embody everything. You know, but, but I mean, Exile on Main Street, Sticky Fingers, you know, the, that you know, Let It Bleed. Those that run of records is unparalleled. Mm. Yeah, but it is. It's rock. Well, Exile on Main Street has a few. I mean, I guess it all it has. It's infused with all of those different things like blues and country. And mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they they go for it straight up, and and you know, and some of those. I mean, that one. such a great tune right yeah <laughs> unbelievable i love the way yeah do you do you miss do you listen to much modern pop music and do you miss the sound of organic instruments on the radio i know you hear it coming back intermittently uh um but, yeah i like some i mean like i flipped out over that fiona apple record i thought it was brilliant i thought that was the best thing i've heard in like 15 years or something <laughs> um but yeah i like i like a lot of new records um a lot of times I don't know what they are, you know? Um, I have two kids, so I'll hear pop stuff that I like. I just, you know, if it's a good song's a good song, you know? Yeah, I, agree. I, mean, there's, I mean, there's production and presentation, right? So, so I can hear a good song. I, I you know, I've, I've, I've sort of listened to enough songs carefully and kind of figured out, you know, cause they're, they're much of them are the same, right? This is not, uh, it's not, um, it's not complicated music necessarily um but um yeah I, I'm, I'm trying to think like if i look at if i look at my list of things that i you know i might run across and listen to on a given day i you know i don't know i i'm pull it up but <clears throat> Yeah, yeah I, I, um, I'm trying to think of what else is, is I've heard recently that I was knocked out by. Anyway, I don't want to get distracted on that. Um, an Apple record was really good and uh, there is a lot of good stuff, but sometimes I do feel like it would be good to see 
in the real, real pop mainstream, because that would have been literally as mainstream as it gets, listening to mm -hmm. like that, and that seems very exciting. But there's there's this temptation to to view that whole era through rose tinted glasses. I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I hear Kendrick Lamar, and I think he sounds like Miles Davis or something. You know, I mean, it's to me, he's amazing. Like, there's there's always stuff that's good out there. Mm. There's always going to be great records. I mean, people say these things. Um, you know, they tend to sort of fetishize a particular era or whatever, and that's fine. You know, because I mean, I have an emotional connection with stuff that I heard in my childhood more so than I'm going to now. But when I, you know, new things. But when I hear new records, I don't think they're, you know. Uh, that they are demonstrably um, or qualitatively better or worse in terms of you know the era. It's yeah, I mean, it's, it's your response to them. Uh, yeah, uh, that's different and that sentimental. You know, pursuit, right? I mean, this is the music that hits people when they're young, a lot of times, and then you get weirdos like me who just keep being obsessed with it, and you know, until you know an age where it's no longer dignified. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah that, that, anyway. that I, I you know I, i'm i just i don't know i i'm I've, I've pulled along things from every era that i like you know from the 90s to the there seem to be sort of the thousand and fives and sixes or like i don't know a lot of great records i know the flaming lips i love them um things like that they come you know but it's just it's just it's little bursts you know because i've heard I mean, because once you've heard the history of the of the the music or the genres that you like right it's it's much more difficult to be surprised by it but it still happens like i was surprised by what we were saying by the fiona apple record i just thought it was astounding it sounded like she moved the ball forward you know um she really did yeah, she really did. I, I wanted to ask about uh, the Blind Melon story because, you know, some people listening won't be familiar with it. They might have heard one or two of your records, but the whole of the 90s or well, in particular, the early 90s, you released two incredible records on Capitol. Uh, what, how, how did, what were the circumstances leading up to the first record, the Blind Melon record? You know, how did you, how did you get signed record the album uh, and what was the recording process of that like? Well, you know, when we got our record deal, we were all, you know, I think I was maybe 20, probably had just turned 20. Um, and I was the youngest and the others are like maybe at the most two years older than me. So we were all pretty young. We didn't know anything. And all of us were from small towns. Um, and Brad and uh, I had a, just a little group going in a garage right out there. And we hadn't met Shannon yet. And or, or, uh, so we're sort of writing songs and trying to figure out how to do that <clears throat> and work in construction jobs and things like that. It's horrible. And, uh, and um, we heard about this singer who had come to town. And I mean, he'd been there for about a week. And I, had, I mean, everybody knew who this guy was already. You know, I mean, he was just, I had heard about him because um, he's out there getting into trouble, <laughs> but he was staying with Axl Rose because he, he uh, and, and this was right after they had done their tour on their first album and they were starting to make their double album, the second, I guess, second albums. And um, <clears throat> Shannon had been in trouble at home in Indiana and he, he jumped on a Greyhound bus, you know? I mean, he literally was the kid in that, in the Guns N' Roses video who gets off the bus at the uh, at the beginning of the video. He was out there staying with uh, Axel and uh, somebody introduced us and he came over and he sat down in our, uh, in this garage where we were rehearsing. He sat down on the floor with an acoustic guitar and he played Change, <clears throat> which was on our first record. And, um, I mean, I remember thinking at the time, it was like, you know, this guy can really sing, <laughs> but he's got an unusual voice. I thought he sounded like a girl almost, you know, or something like, yes, you know, he's up in that register. And um, it was, 
I mean, it just, it just took my breath away. I was like, that dude is a rock star and I'm definitely going to, uh, <laughs> try to get him in, in this group. So, yeah, I mean, we hit it off and we just started writing songs and then we got Christopher in the band and we were, we originally had a different drummer, but, uh, it just wasn't working out. And so I called Glenn, you know, from back home and he, he was, his car was already packed up to move to North Carolina to join a different band. And he decided to come out and do this. And yeah, we, so we he came out there and, um, and we, um, we got a record deal without playing a single live show in front of people. We just, we started recording our uh, demos. And, um, and so that got into the hands of uh, this lawyer who shopped it around to, um, uh, to the record companies. I mean, we had maybe eight or nine of them that were, were taking us out to dinners and, you know, the whole nine yards. And we were just kind of like, what the hell is going on? But, you know, we knew Shannon was a star and we knew that we could write songs and um, we just hadn't done it yet. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, uh, when we, when we got the deal, um, we didn't have enough songs to make the first record, but we told them that we did. <laughs> we played, we played enough, we played four or five songs. We would do these little, they would come to our rehearsal and we'd play four or five. Um, and, and it worked. That's amazing. But, you know, and then they gave us, you know, they gave us an advance. What's that? That's amazing. Is that, was that? Say it again. That was amazing. Was that very unusual then? Well, you have to, all right, think about this. Think about this. Let me just plug this in real quick. Shannon, <clears throat> at the same time that this was happening, Shannon was doing that Guns N' Roses album, right? So from the perspective of the record company, it must have it must have looked like oh my god this guy's singing with Guns N' Roses they're the biggest band in the world then we definitely should you know sign this band even if they're even passable you know make some money off of it so I don't know what the thinking was but I you know eventually by the time we really we sensed that there was some of that but we also knew that there were some people who were genuinely interested in in some of these songs like we had on our demo we had um, change tones of home and uh a couple of others that ended up on the first record <clears throat> so they you know there were some there were people who were genuinely interested and then there were like the sort of bandwagon jumpers you know because once all these people you know started uh you know showing interest then the rest of them do because they don't want to miss out on something so um <clears throat> but they uh we, we we connected with the people at Capitol and, and it turned out to be a good decision because, you know, I, they stuck with us, you know, for a lot longer than most labels would have. And they spent a lot of money to make our record happen. So, you know, I mean, we didn't really, you know, we didn't have the typical litany of complaints about our record company, you know, based on how they handled the first record. No, I mean, it, what was it? What was it like to see the album become such a success and how long did it take to make? Well, when we went, we, we, so right after we got our deal, you know, they gave us money, right? We never had any money. So of course, you know, we all went out and bought guitars. Like I bought that guitar that's in the No Rain video, you know, that, that day. And that was the guitar I used on the entire first record. But, um, uh, we started having fun with that money <laughs> in Los Angeles, but it, it, it didn't involve, it didn't involve being in a recording studio or, you know, practicing or whatever it involved, you know, staying out all hours of the night. So um, <clears throat> we decided to move to North Carolina, uh, like move away from Los Angeles where all of these distractions were. And because I'm telling you, if you hand, a bunch of 20 year old dudes, the keys, they're going to drive it straight in the ditch in that situation. So what we did was we went to a place where there was really, we didn't know anybody really. And we, we, we rented a house and um, we put aluminum foil on all of the windows on the inside. So when you, it was, uh, it, it could be, you know, noon and you would never know it, but it would be, it would be, you know, it was blackout 
you know, 24 seven. And so we just like kind of got lost. We, we, we disregarded time and sat there and really focused and wrote like the rest of what, you know, was our first record basically. And then some, and, uh, but also like we got pretty good, you know, at playing together. And that was really the key because we were going to cut this record live, which is exactly what we did. We, 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 you know, we told the record company, I mean, we didn't, you know, we'll do, you know, the promotional marketing, all this stuff, whatever, but, but no one can come in the studio. I mean, we'll give you the record and it'll be done. You know, that was our attitude and our manager back management was backing us. So that's what we did. We made, we did just how we wanted to do it. And um, we found uh, Rick Parasher. Um, you know, he was suggested by the label and I think they felt good about him because, you know, he had had success with the Pearl Jam record. So, um, you know, and that was the hot flavor of, of that time, right? So um, we went up there, set up the mics and uh, we just, we, we really just ran takes. And, and that record is pretty much live. There's, there's some, you know, minimal overdubs, but never more than one or two. And usually the performances are, are uh, what we would do is we would cut, we would do maybe five takes of a song till we knew we had, okay, there's a good one, you know? And then if something was wrong with it, there would be a, you know, you, back then, th these were the days where you would splice it, literally cut the tape. Right. So like we would have the front half of this track is good. This, but the, you know, on this take, but you know, take three has a good second half. And so then they get out the razor blade and they cut the tape. And so they don't do that anymore. But I remember the first time they did it. And I think no rain is actually that the, the instrumental track might be, I think there's a, there's a, there's a splice somewhere in it where it's just two different takes stuck together. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, the first time I saw them do that, it was, it was terrifying, you know, cause you, 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 you know, you're, you're talking big two inch reels of tape, right? So they're big and, and then they, you know, you're thinking, okay, we, that's the magic that we're never going to do that again, but there's a problem that it has to be fixed. And so, so they, when they do that, you watch and you're like, oh, man, there's always some engineer guy and I'm thinking this is a kid if he screws this up we're gonna be pissed he's not gonna be happy but you know it didn't happen did, did you know that no um rain I have heard horror story such a smash hit uh, we thought I think we probably thought change was a, a more obvious hit to us I knew that song no rain was a had something and um you know Keep in mind when we started doing these these songs, we hadn't played enough shows to really see what people were reacting to. So, um, but uh, I thought that No Rain sounded like the theme of some children's television show or something. You know, it just had this like sort of bounce to it, and it felt, yeah, it felt like sunshine. You know, a little bit. It didn't feel like the rest of the record necessarily, but it didn't feel out of place either. Yeah, you know, it felt like the same band. But it was just, oh, this band's doing something kind of whimsical, you know? And so, um, but when I saw the video and, you know, for the first time, I was like, oh yeah, that's definitely a huge hit. I mean, it was so obvious when it was coupled with the, the images. So, um, I mean, at least it was, at least we thought it was. You know, but the issue for us, you know, at that time was that there had been, I think, three singles or maybe four even before No Rain was released right so people were kind of giving up you know we were out on the road for a year by this point and worn out we'd been around the united states you know three four five times in a van you know just looping just touring just constantly and so it become a grind and um and then that happened <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, I mean, it, 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 if, if there's ever been like, I mean, I, I, I know these things happen and, but it was literally an overnight thing because we got a call. I, I'll never forget this. We were out there and they said, oh, they're going to make your video what they called the uh, buzz bin or whatever at the time. It was like, they, they make it like it's a, um, you know, they just start just jamming it down everybody's throats. 
And, um, and when that happened, uh, we were in the first night after it had been airing for a day or two, we were in St. Louis playing this club called Mississippi Nights. And I, um, <clears throat> I remember like looking out my hotel window at like two in the afternoon and there was a line down the block, you know, it was like, and then going around the building because it was our hotel was right across from the venue. And, um, and so I thought, well, maybe like, you know, Bill Clinton is here or something. I don't know, the president or somebody, you know, but it was, it was for the show. And it just, it just was like that from then on. And I mean, you know, we, the, the night before we probably played in front of 400 people, you know, so we were playing clubs and then that club was way oversold and the rest of them were, and they started moving us up into different venues and, you know, we thought we were the fucking Beatles for about two months. <laughs> um but you know you get over that pretty quickly in terms of uh like if you've got your any sense about you you know you get maybe two months tops where it's okay to be an asshole and after that you need to figure it out and and in terms of the you know high points uh you mentioned that you were a big fan of the rolling stones so what was it like to kind of support them on the voodoo lounge tour just you know, it was one of those things that that you wouldn't even you wouldn't dream to put it on your bucket list, right? But um, they were super cool. <laughs> like we we had a lot of fun with them. Like we, Brad and I would go, you know, on show days we would go to the um, you know in the dressing room they had they brought a you know a snooker table like a proper English snooker table you know like a real marble slate and everything and um so we played and brad was a sh is a shark pool player like he's brad would go when we were on tour he would go into pool halls at you know two in the morning by himself and start gambling with people and he would win you know he'd come he made money on tour playing pool and um so he made money from keith richards and ron wood too and uh because they liked to shoot and you know they would show up every day and you know big you know jack daniels and coke or something and then shoot pool they were the coolest guys all of them just super sweet gentlemen you know very nice you know and i you know i got to know some of their kids later on in new york you know and you know they just i don't know they just seem like they seem like solid people oddly <laughs> and uh you know keith's a genius so but they they were they were great i mean i think we did maybe i can't remember how many shows we did it wasn't a lot but it was enough to kind of hang out and really you know experience it as you say one of those bucket list moments yeah you could have playing with the stones on your bucket list because it would seem so unrealistic but obviously <laughs> what ended up happening uh in in the mid 90s uh was was incredibly tragic uh how, how i mean it's impossible to say how you feel feel about it now but how what was it like at the time and how have your feelings about it evolved over the years well you know <clears throat> I, shannon and i were really close friends i mean i mean we all were really i mean we had just been through like this incredible experience together and that that really you know seals you know bonds and whatnot i mean we were forever bonded but you know I, he and I, I lived together in la for a while you know like we kind of got to know each other personally really well and i would go to indiana and stay with him and his family and so you know I mean, we just loved each other we we're brothers and you know i was with him that whole night before um you know right there with him and um so uh you know we ended up you know, getting to that hotel in New Orleans and I went to bed and he didn't. And, uh, you know, this is like 10 or 11 in the morning the next day. But um, I just was in shock, man. I, I mean, when I got that phone call, you know, I woken up with that phone call, right? And, um, was, you know, I thought I was getting woken up to go to sound check, right? So, um, you know, it just broke my heart, you know, forever. Like, I'll never get over that. You know, it was... Um, but you know, 
I'm able to look back on him, you know, with just a great affection, obviously. And, and I can hear his voice in my head. It's clear as a bell, you know, and there are people who have passed in my life, you know, for that were important to me or whatever. And, you know, their voice kind of fades a little bit sometimes, but not his. I mean, because honestly, he never, ever stopped talking ever. I mean, he just, just talked bullshit all the time, like, you know, nonsense, whatever. He just couldn't stop talking. So, um, you know, it was just great. You know, I would, I would give anything for that conversation again, but it is still ringing in my head. And um, so, yeah, I think I was in shock for probably 15 years. I didn't, I didn't really care about music that much anymore, you know, or I, I didn't, I didn't care about, um, you know, I, I sort of, in a way, like I, I, I paid lip service to playing music, you know, because I felt like the, that's what I should be doing, but it was just kind of like diminished in me in a way. And, and, you know, it came back, you know, a few years ago, like it just came all the way back and, you know, hard, you know, but, you know, I just, I just, it just, just, I don't know, it just kicked my ass for a long time. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I'm grateful for, for having known him. And, uh, you know, having done what we did, you know, together, it would, you know, and it was, it was really like, it's one of those things too, like, cause we never got to make the, the good blind melon record. Right. I mean, I mean, it was definitely going somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and there were songs in the pipeline that I thought like, okay, this is like, you know, this is going to be a, a, another level, right. It's going to go somewhere else. I think we would have gone to, on to, to bigger and better things but you know well, such is life you currently uh, are because you've been releasing new music or well, new singles uh, over the last yeah year. yeah uh, and yeah is, is there a plan to, to release an album or are you going to continue releasing singles like this yeah there is <laughs> there is we're doing it um <clears throat> You know, the, we when the when the when the pandemic shutdown happened, we were three days away from flying to to out to California to the studio. So it really like it was like, okay, I think God hates Blind Melon, you know. But um, that's the joke. Um, but um, we ended up, uh, you know, sort of doing some things remotely. But that is the plan. And, and there's something, you know, we're gonna do something a little. We, we've got some big ish plans about how we're going to do that and how we're going to present it wow. you know in a unique way we have a unique opportunity so i think you know we're going to try to take it um but yeah that's uh we we're about to release another couple of songs and uh i don't know we're kind of so we've been finishing them piecemeal rather than just all at once will these singles be on the album well see you know because I don't, I don't know because what, what the reason I don't know is because in the interim, other songs have gotten written, right? So now, yeah. well, those songs exist. They're out there now. I think there's five of them or something. There's going to be a few more coming up and um, that are already done. And then maybe we just press those up and release them and just, you know, go in and just do a whole another one. I don't know. I don't really see why to me, the, those, those, uh, distinctions and boundaries or whatever or categories are kind of broken down because of the way music is distributed now and because of what we can do we can record i mean all of us have like the technology has enabled people like us to record i mean i can make a record in my house now you know and um and so it's kind of liberating in that way and i always thought that you know the album format is a little strange right because you, you okay here's 10 songs in an album. And then over the next year, we're going to selectively curate and represent them to you as singles, you know, and then we'll do it again. Well, why not? Uh, I mean, why not just, you know, why not just put them out as you're done with them? And, you know, I don't know if you, I, and I think the way these things, you know, with attention spans, you know, being what they are in this diminished state mm -hmm. um, that, you're better off maybe just reminding people of your existence every month or so with a new song, <laughs> you know, because I, I, I thought about this because I watched a, a group that I really like, uh, Tool, right? Their record came out yeah. uh, 
I love that band. I thought that was an absolute, another one. There's a masterpiece. I thought that was a great record. And it came out, you know, with a lot of, you know, pizzazz and whatever. And, and, and there was a lot of press about it and whatever. And then it kind of like, I didn't really hear about it anymore. Not I listened to it, but I don't think it was like on people's, you know, now had they just, you know, presented it, you know, one at a time, maybe they would have kept that attention. Those songs justified it too. Some of them were like 10 minutes long, you know? I need two weeks to absorb that song. <laughs> but, but they've got such a loyal fan base tool that I guess the album. Yeah, yeah I'm talking about that out, you know, whatever, the people who aren't those people, right? The, the sort of, the, the, the viewing public who looks at pop culture publications and, watches stuff and then you know whatever is marketed on actively is what they know in that moment yeah, yeah you've probably got a point there w when when are the next songs coming out do you know when the next the next singles are coming out i thought it would have already been i thought one of them was already supposed to be out you know i i, I that part you know i i try to i like to okay the mix is good the master is good the artwork is a, is not embarrassing now somebody else takes it, right? And, well, and you know, I'm like, I'm good to release that. So that's, that's, that's the way it's going. Well, in any case, I'd recommend to my listeners. That's, you know, that's not my purview. Six, all of the recent six singles. Okay. That I, I was just going to say, uh, regardless of whether, you know, you put it out and, and you're done with it, and a lot of people are like that, I would hugely recommend to the listeners that all of your recent six singles, that well, there's six singles that I've heard, uh, all the way since way down and far below that you put out in 2019. Uh, it's been really good to have new music from you. Um, so I, yeah, I'm very excited as well about, about the album. Listen, this band, I'm, I'm telling you, I feel like we're in a unique place in a sense, because you know, you can think about bands who have tried to do this sort of thing, right? We're long past the time that, that I think, you know, most people would think, Oh, this band is absolutely no relevance or, there's no need for them to do this. But um, the thing about us is, is there's a lot of latent potential in this band that never got exploited. Every single person in the band is, can write a song, a real song. And so that part of it is, I mean, we're just, uh, we never run out of ideas ever that I've ever experienced. It's just, we're all so screwed up and internally, you know, dysfunctional and have just had all these like, you know, you know, things happen that, um, you know, we have to get, uh, it's really more about logistics than anything. Because if you put us in a room together and roll, you know, the tape, it'll be good. I'm 100% certain of it every time. Like I have confidence in what we do. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, life has taken twists and turns and, but, um, you know, I do think that we reached a place though, we, where we had sort of stabilized all that and, and, and are now, you know, ready to do it. It's really just been getting past the last year and a half um, and finding, you know, a time where it makes sense to do this. What we're, you know, part of what we're doing involves some, you know, you know, you have to, uh, you have to pay attention to the climate <laughs> if that's a clue. This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different.